we've been seeing a lot of very interesting things the last week, and you're learning a lot. Uh, I think now you could tell the, uh, the difference between an oil press, right, and a wine press. Uh, so you can tell the difference between an oil press, a wine press, uh, also a grain, a grain press we've been seeing it. So I thought I'd give a message today, it's called the grain, the wine, and the oil, to explain from scripture, what do these all mean? We're seeing hundreds of them in Israel. You know, they found, I believe it's something like 240 uh, wine presses in the land of Israel from ancient times. They also found even more oil presses, uh, grain presses. So many times in scripture we see Yahweh refer to the oil, the bread, and the wine as an idiomatic phrase of blessing in the covenant land of Israel. And I think in our diaspora sometimes we miss this. We miss the fact of the importance of it, so that's why I'd like to go over it today. Numbers 18.8. Numbers 18.8 says, And Yahweh spoke to Aaron, saying, I, behold, I have given to you the charge of my heave offerings, of all the devoted things of the sons of Israel. I have given them to you for the anointing and to your sons by a perpetual statute. So we know this, that the Levites are given these things. If we drop down to verse 12, he says, And all the best of the oil, of the new wine, and the wheat, the grain, the first fruits of them which give to Yahweh I have given to you. The first fruits of all that is in their land which they bring into their land, into Yahweh shall be yours. Every clean one in your house shall eat it. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. So we see that even the first fruit to Yahweh, the devoted things of the grain, the oil, and the wine are being given to the priest, the substance given over to them, Deuteronomy 18, 3 through 5, Deuteronomy the 18th chapter. He says, And this shall be the priest's due from the people, from those that offer a sacrifice, whether an ox or sheep, that they shall give to the priest the leg and the two cheeks and the stomach, the first of your grain, of your new wine, and your oil. And the first of your fleece of your flock you shall give to him. For Yahweh your Elohim has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand to serve in the name of Yahweh he and his sons continuously. So again, we see the same pattern. Second Chronicles 31 in verse 4. Second Chronicles 31 and verse 4 it says, And he commanded the people, those that lived in Jerusalem, to give the portion of the priests and of the Levites in order that they might be strong in the Torah of Yahweh. And as the word spread, the sons of Israel brought abundantly the first fruits of grain, of new wine, and oil, and honey, and all the produce of the field, and all the tithe of all. They brought very much. Uh, we just came from Sukkot. We saw the harvest fruits of Sukkot, Deuteronomy 11, 14. We see the same thing. And I will give the rain of your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. So we see there, it's, it's like a package we're seeing over and over and over. The grain, the wine, and the oil. And again, what do we say about Sukkot, the yearly cycle that comes from that? That, you know, they're starting uh, the cycle now, the year just ended, the new agricultural year is starting, they're going to plow, they're going to uh, put down their seed, and now they have to pray fervently for rain to get that new rain, and it's going to be a long winter, and hopefully if they're blessed, they're going to get their grain in the spring, in Aviv, and then as the summer goes along again, the hard, rough summer months, they're going to hope to get the wine and the oil after that. Deuteronomy 17 or 12, rather, 17 and 18. Deuteronomy 12, 17 and 18. He says, You are not able to eat the tithe of your grain within your gates, and of your new wine and your oil, and the first things of your herd and your flock, and any of your vows which you vow in your free will offering and the heave offering of your hand. But you shall eat it before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which Yahweh shall choose, Jerusalem. We were just there. You and your son and your daughter and your male slave and your female slave and the Levite who is within your gate. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh Elohim and all you put your hand to do. So we're seeing the grain, the oil, and the wine all connected together with obedience, with rejoicing, with blessing. Leviticus 23. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. 
we see even when it comes to uh, the, the way sheep offering, one of the most important offerings of the Bible, chapter 23 of Leviticus, verse 9, it says, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come into the land which I am giving to you, and have reaped its harvest, and have brought in the omer, the beginning of your harvest to the priest, then you shall wave the omer before Yahweh for your acceptance. On the morrow of the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall prepare a lamb in the day you wave the omer, one without blemish, a son of a year, for a burnt offering to Yahweh. And its grain offering shall be two-tenths part of flour. Soleil is the word. It's a very fine flour that's milled many times. With oil, a fire offering to Yahweh, a sweet fragrance, and its drink offering, a fourth of a hint of wine. So we see even the first, the uh, wave sheep offering is dealing with the grain, the oil, and the wine. Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 11. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 11. And you shall keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do them. And it shall be because you're, you hear judgments and keep and do them, even Yahweh your Elohim will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your oxen and the wealth of your flock, and the land which he has sworn to your fathers to give it to you. So many, many times. And that's the reason why when we're looking throughout the land, we're seeing hundreds of commercial uh, olive oil presses, grain presses, wine presses. Because throughout the Bible, we see it's extremely important to worship. It's important to everyday life. And it's important to their relationship with Yahweh. So I want to start explaining now. What, what does it mean? What is the purpose of this scripture? And basically, I want to show... The purpose of the grain offering is the flower like our life. To dust we come, to dust we shall return. That bread is the staple food from ancient biblical times. And that's why it's hard for me to uh, believe that bread and gluten and all these things are bad. Uh, although I do believe it's true today, probably from the way that they're growing it or modifying it or whatever. But in biblical times, bread was what you're eating every day of your life. The same, the importance of oil that has to deal with Yahweh's spirit. And wine, we know wine is uh, indicative of blood, like at Passover time, and also happiness. So I want to start in Genesis 3 and verse 19. Genesis 3 and verse 19. Yahweh says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for you have been taken out of it, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Like I said, flour is like uh, Ezekiel 37, you know, the dryness of life, the grain, the flowers, like our life, like our flesh, like the dust, the dust we come, the dust we shall return. Leviticus 17.11, talking about the wine, Leviticus 17.11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to atone for your souls. For it is the blood which makes atonement for the soul. So we know that it's a problem with the Jews today that many times Jews will say, well, no, 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 we don't need sacrifices when you read them this scripture. And they'll say, the only thing we need to do is good works. You know, if you do good works, you don't need it. But Leviticus 17, 11 is very clear. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to atone for your souls, for it is the blood which makes atonement for the souls. And Exodus 30, Exodus 30 and verse 24, this is talking about this special oil that's made in the temple. And it says, in 500 of cassia by the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hin of olive oil. And you shall make it an oil of holy anointing, ointment compound, the work of the perfumer, and oil of holy anointing, it shall be to you. That's very interesting that they tell all of this how they make this holy anointing oil. They found this down near Qumran and it gave 900 pounds, exactly the way the Bible tells it to be, that they had it there. And also olive oil from the uh, 
I believe the second temple period that they found olive oil over there. And you shall make it an oil of holy anointing, an ointment compound, the work of a perfumer, an oil of holy anointing it shall be. And you shall anoint with it the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony, and the table and the vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering, and all its vessels and the labor in its base. And you shall sanctify them, and they shall become most holy. Everything touching them shall become holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons, and you shall consecrate them to minister as priests to me. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil for me for your generations. It shall not be poured on the flesh of man, and you shall not make any like it in its proportion. It is holy, it shall be holy to you. If a man prepares any like it, or who gives from it to a stranger, he shall be cut off from his people. So we see the holy anointing oil was not meant to duplicate, it wasn't meant to be used every day. And as we were learning at the oil press, only the very, very first cold pressing that was not manipulated by man, by weights, uh, could be used in the temple for the, uh, for the menorah and whatnot. And we know that oil is representative in scripture of the Holy Spirit. So I want to go through all three of these, the grain offering, the wine offering, and the oil offering, to show you where they connect from this. Leviticus 2, first going over the grain offering. Because like I said, so many times in the scripture we see the three of them together. The, the oil, the grain, and the wine. The completeness of Yahweh's blessing on his people. Leviticus 2, and verse 1 and 2 says, When a person brings near an offering, a grain offering to Yahweh, his offering shall be a flower, and he shall pour oil on it, and he shall put frankincense on it. And he shall bring it to the sons of Aaron the priest, and shall take from its fullness of the handful of its flour, and from its oil, <coughs> and from its frankincense. And the priest shall burn it as incense on the altar, a memorial offering, a fire offering, a soothing fragrance to Yahweh. If we drop down to verse uh, 10. And the rest of the food or grain offering is for Aaron and his sons, most holy of the offerings of Yahweh. Any food offering which you shall bring to Yahweh, you shall not make with leaven. For all leaven and all honey, you shall not burn it as incense a fire offering. And why? Because it puffs up. So you're not to use anything that would... Uh, puff up the offering, neither honey nor leaven. As an offering of first fruits, you shall bring them to Yahweh, but they shall not go up on the altar for a soothing fragrance. And every offering of your food offering shall you shall season with salt, and you shall not let the salt of the covenant of your Elohim be lacking from your food offering or your grain offering. You shall offer salt with all your offerings. And why salt is a preservative? That's where you get the word salary from. Comes from salt because people used to be paid in salt. People say he's worth his weight in salt. Because salt preserved food, it preserved meat, it preserved everything. And animals need salt to survive. And if you bring near a, a grain offerings of first fruits to Yahweh, fresh ears roasted with fire, grains from a garden, you shall bring near your first fruits for a food offering or a grain offering. And you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. And the priest shall burn it as incense and its memorial offering from its grains and from its oils, beside all its frankincense, a fire offering to Yahweh. So the grain offering was a continual reminder of the people that Yahweh is the provider of their daily bread and sustainer of life. And it's very interesting, this word for grain offering can also mean gift. It can also mean gift and recognized as the gift of life that Yahweh provides through the offering. This offering was to accompany one of the other sacrifices and was made without yeast or honey as both of these can ferment, which would disqualify the offering. We know in Matthew 26, 26 at the last Pesach, what does Yeshua say? As they ate taking the bread and blessing it, Yeshua broke and gave to the disciples and said, take this, eat, this is my body. So we see the grain offering connected with the Messiah the same way. The Messiah being a gift, the gift of Yahweh. If you look up in the New Testament, the word for grace and the word for gift, it's the same word. They're interchangeable. You know, Yahweh's gift is Yahweh's grace. 
And again, the same, that the word for grain offering can mean the same thing. John 6, in verse 28. John the 6th chapter, in verse 28. Then they said to him, What may we do that may, we may do the works of Elohim? Yeshua answered and said to them, This is the work of Elohim that you believe into him whom that one sent. And they said to him, Then what miraculous sign do you do that we may see and may believe you? What do you work? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread out of the heaven to eat. Then Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Moses is not giving you the bread out of heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread out of heaven. For this bread, that of Elohim, is he who came down from the heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Master, always give us this bread. Yeshua said to him, I am the bread of life. The one coming to me will not at all hunger, and the one believing in me will not thirst ever. So we see the first part of this, the oil, the grain, and the wine, all of them connecting with Yahweh's blessing, and the grain connected with, like I said, the very substance of life, and Yeshua being the bread of life, as we see here. The next is the wine. We go to Exodus 29. Exodus 29. And verse 39. Exodus 29, 39. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the second you shall offer between the evenings. This is the daily sacrifice. The first one is Boboker at the break of dawn. The second is Ber Erebim at the going down of the sun. So basically from the time the sun is rising to the time the sun is setting, it's showing the continual sacrifice of the Heavenly Father. And this, this is part of the sacrifice. He says, and a tenth of fine flour, anointed with beaten oil, and fourth of a hand, and a drink offering, a fourth of an end of wine for the one lamb. So besides sacrificing the lamb, they're sacrificing the grain with the oil, with the wine. All part of the life cycle, the daily life cycle. And you shall offer the second lamb between the evenings. You shall do it like the morning food offering and the drink offering for a soothing fragrance, a fire offering to Yahweh. So literally, it's to sweeten the face of Yahweh. It's a soothing fragrance. This shall be a continual burnt offering to your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the face of Yahweh there where I meet you to speak to you. So again, the wine offering is sweetening the face of Yahweh. Amos 9, Amos the ninth chapter, and verse 13. Amos 9 and verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, that the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who draws along the seed. And the mountain shall drip new must, and all the hills will be dissolved. And I will bring back the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and live in them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine of them. They shall also make gardens and eat the, the fruit of them, and I will plant them on their land, and they will never again be pulled up out of the land which I have given to them says Yahweh Elohim. So, again, the wine isn't just something that people are doing for fun. It certainly isn't something they're doing to get drunk. But anytime you see the wine in the Bible, it's showing prosperity. It's showing that there's a blessing there. Like I said, the word that we use, Hadad, when they were smashing the wine in Isaiah, it says, no longer are they saying Hadad. No longer is there blessing in the land. No longer is there happiness. But here when they're coming back, what's happening? They're building vineyards, and they're drinking the wine. The Yahweh's blessing is upon them. Genesis 14 and verse 18. <coughs> we see when Melchizedek comes to meet Abraham. It says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High El, El Elyon. So Melchizedek, who is Yeshua, when you read Hebrews, the 5th and 7th chapter, it's very evident that Melchizedek is Yeshua. Where people get mixed up sometimes is they think Melchizedek is a personal name. It's not. It's a title. Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness. We know who the king of righteousness is. But we see that Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, 
is bringing out bread and wine to Abraham, just like on the Passover. Matthew 26 and verse 28, and Yeshua's last Passover, Matthew 26 and verse 28, when he's taking the wine, he says, for this represents my blood of the new covenant, which concerning many is being poured out for remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not at all drink of this fruit of the vine after this, until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of Yahweh. The new wine is called Tarosh, you know, and, and why are they happy? It's not the best tasting wine, but it's the best wine because it's the new wine. That means there's a blessing. You're getting the wine that's coming with it. So it's really interesting that the wine is representing the blood of Yeshua and his sacrifice, which at this time is a time of mourning, but then it's also representing the wedding supper that's coming and being with him during that time. And like he says, so here his blood is being poured out on the last Passover, but he's saying, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom with you at the wedding supper when he returns. Isaiah 62 and verse 7. Isaiah 62 and verse 7. He says, and give him no rest. You know, if we read maybe this verse 1. For Zion's sake I will not be silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness. And Yeshua as a burning torch. So we know from Isaiah 40 all the way through 66. Those last 26 chapters are all messianic. All about the kingdom. Particularly the from chapter 50 on. They get heavier and heavier. But here he's talking about the redemption of Zion. And everything that's coming back. And now I'll go down to verse 7. And he says, and give him no rest until he sets up and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Yahweh has sworn by his right hand and by the might of his arm, surely I will no longer give your grain as food to your enemies. And the sons of a stranger will not drink your new wine for which you have labored. So again, punishment is there's no grain, there's no wine, there's no oil. But blessing is in the kingdom. Your stranger ain't going to take it anymore. That You are going to get what you're working for. But those who have gathered it shall eat it and praise Yahweh. And they who have collected it will drink it in my holy courts. Pass, pass through the gates, prepare the way of the people, raise up, raise up the highway, clear it from stones, lift up a banner over the people, messianic phrase. Behold, Yahweh has made it heard to the ends of the earth. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, Yeshua comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they call them the holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh. And to you it shall be called, so now, a city not forsaken. So again, we see that the wine is showing the fullness of the blessing. The fullness of the blessing that's coming. Third part, the oil. We go to Leviticus 24. Leviticus, the 24th chapter. I'll read the first nine verses. It says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel, and they shall bring to you pure olive oil, beaten for the light, to cause a light to burn continuously. Right now, as you read that, you're thinking about all you learned about how to make the pure olive oil. It's not just any olive oil, but it has to be the pure, the cold press, the one that man hasn't manipulated. And then he says, Outside the veil of the testimony, in the tent of meeting, Aaron shall arrange it from evening until morning before Yahweh continuously a perpetual statute throughout your generations. He shall arrange the lamps on the pure gold menorah before Yahweh continuously. Right? So it's showing Yahweh's spirit within us continuously, that we're continuously having his spirit being led by his spirit. And you shall take flour and shall bake twelve cakes with it. Two tents shall be in one cake, and you shall set them in two rows, six on one row on the pure table, the pure gold table before Yahweh. And you shall put pure frankincense on the row, and it shall be the bread of a memorial, a fire offering to Yahweh. So again, the bread of his presence is washed for the twelve tribes of Israel. So again, it's showing that, just like Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dry bones, that whole house of Israel being resurrected at this time, being part of his kingdom. Verse 8. And on each Sabbath you shall arrange it before Yahweh continuously from the sons of Israel in never-ending covenant. And it shall belong to Aaron and to his sons, and they shall eat it in the sanctuary, for it is most holy to him, from the fire offerings of Yahweh, a never-ending statute. 
So again, showing the continualness of Yahweh's covenant. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 24. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 24. And of Asher he said, Asher shall be blessed with sons. Let him be accepted by his brothers and dip his foot in oil. I was saying this, that's why uh, a company called Zion uh, something, excavation, that for years they were up here in the north digging for oil. They never found oil there, but they found one of the biggest gas finds, natural gas, in the world. They're working on that right now, but because of the scripture, you know, that Asher's foot is being dipped in oil. Probably he's not talking about petroleum oil or whatever. He's probably talking about olive oil. But sometimes in prophecy, you never know, something can be dual. But if we drop down to verse 27, it says, The Elohim of old is a refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall cast the enemy out from before you, and shall say, Destroy. And Israel shall live alone in safety, the fountain of Jacob, in a land of grain and wine. And his heavens drop down to Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yahweh, the shield of your health. And who is the sword of your excellency? And your enemy shall be found liars before you, and you shall tread on the high places. So again, showing Yahweh's continual blessing for them. The grain, the wine, and the oil. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. In verse 8. This is when Eliyahu, right, is being cared for by the woman in Zarephath. And he says, And the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, Rise up, go to Zarephath that belongs to Sidon. So this is up in Lebanon. And you shall live there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. And he rose up and went to Zarephath and came into the entrance of the city. And behold, a widow woman was gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Please bring to me a little water in a vessel, and I shall drink. And she went to bring it, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a bit of bread in your hand. And she said, As Yahweh your Elohim lives, I do not have a cake, only a handful of meal in a pitcher, and a little oil in a jar. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, and will go in and prepare for myself and for my son, and we shall end up. We know there's a famine going on, right? There's not a lot of food. So there's only a little bit of oil, a little bit of Yahweh's spirit, and a little bit of meal, a little bit of life that's <laughs> left there. But now, when Yahweh's spirit is coming and his prophet, looks what happens, look what happens here. And Eliyahu says to her, do not fear. Go, do according to your word. Only first make me a little cake of it, and bring to me an afterwards prepare for you and your son. For so says Yahweh the Elohim of Israel, the pitcher of meal shall not be consumed, and the jar of oil shall not fail until the day that Yahweh sends rain on the land. The latter rain, right, that's coming. So again, this is something that we can bank on in the last days, that we can pray to him, you know. Don't let your spirit go from me, right, like David was saying, that Yahweh will provide. And she went and did according to the word of Eliyahu, and she ate, she and, she and he and her household many days. The pitcher of meal was not consumed, and the jar of oil did not fail according to the word of Yahweh that he spoke by the hand of Eliyahu. So again, showing Yahweh's divine providence. Second Kings 4, we see the similar story with Elisha, who takes over from Eliyahu. Elisha. Second Kings 4. And it talks, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets had cried to Elisha, saying, My husband, your servant, is dead. And you know that your servant has seen Yahweh, and the lender has come to take my two children to himself for slaves. And Elisha said to him, What shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in the house? And she said, Your handmaid is nothing in the house except a pot of oil. Wow, nothing except the pot of oil. We see oil is important. Never think, oh, this is all I have. So what happens here now? And he said, Go, bake vessels for yourself from outside. From your neighbors, empty vessels, do not let them be few. And you shall go in and shut the door in you, you and your sons, and you shall pour out into all these vessels, and you shall set aside the full ones. And she left him and shut the door on her and her sons. They carried to her, and she poured out. And it happened when the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring another vessel to me. And he said to her, There is no other vessel. And then the oil stopped. So 
So, uh, and she came and told the man of Elohim, she said, go, and he said, go, sell the oil and repay your loan, and you and your son shall live from the rest. And the day came that Elisha crossed over to Shunan, and a great woman was there, and she laid hold on him to eat bread, and it happened as often as he passed by, he turned there to eat the bread. So can you see the bread and the oil? But the oil sustains her, the oil from Yahweh. Much oil representative of Yahweh's spirit. 1 Samuel 16. And this is where Saul disqualifies himself from his position because of pride and disobedience. And then we see what happened. Yahweh says to Samuel, Until when will you mourn for Saul? For I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. And I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have seen a king for me among his sons. So he's filling his horn with oil. Drop down to verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the young men? And he said, There yet remains the youngest, and behold, he is feeding the flock. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in, and he was ruddy, meaning red-headed, with beautiful eyes and good form. And Yahweh said, Rise up, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of Yahweh came upon David from that day and onward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So like we were reading with the holy oil, you know, it was only to be used by the priest for these special purposes. And when you understand the represent, representation of this, Yahweh giving his spirit, which has to be done what? By the laying on of hands of an elder. We see why it wouldn't be proper for just anybody to go and take anointing oil and just start pouring it on people. There's a, there's, a, there's a holy purpose for it. It wouldn't be proper for anybody just to do because we see it's all part of Yahweh's providence. Psalm 23. Psalm 23 and verse 5. He says, you prepare a table for me. This is the, 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 the great psalm of the shepherd, right? Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. And verse 5, he says, you prepare a table for me before the ones vexing me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh for days without end. Great psalm. Short psalm, but a great psalm, right? I say that Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you want something, then Yahweh is not your shepherd. If Yahweh is your shepherd, then you have green pastures, which means there's nothing in your life you're looking for. doesn't mean you don't try to better yourself. That's an Elohim principle. But it means is that we're not lacking. We're not always thinking, oh, if I had this or if I had that, Yahweh is my shepherd. And part of that fulfillment is what? He's anointing my head with oil. My cup runs over. My cup overfloweth. That Yahweh is giving good, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of Yahweh for days without end. Psalm 45, Psalm 45, and verse 6. Now this is a messianic psalm, right? So the Messiah is here saying this. He says, Your throne, O Elohim, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You love righteousness and you hate wickedness. Therefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your fellows. So again, Yeshua was anointed, like we see here. And he's also called Elohim. Two Elohims here. Elohim the Son, Elohim the Father. Your throne, Elohim, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your fellows. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, we see the New Testament confirms this, that the Holy Spirit is representative of oil. shall be compared to ten virgins who taking their lamps went out to a meeting of the bridegroom and the bride. And five of them were wise and five foolish. Those being foolish taking their lamps did not take oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But the bridegroom delaying all nodded and slept. And at midnight a cry occurred, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins were aroused and prepared their lamps. 
But the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there not be enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy for yourself. But they going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those ready went into with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And afterward the rest of the virgins also came, saying, Master, open to us. And answering, he said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore be alert, for you do not know the day or the hour in which the Son of Man comes. So a lot of interesting parables we can get. And here one is, while they're going out buying, you know, the bridegroom comes. You know, we know today there's a lot of buying and selling in the body of Messiah that's not very good. Freely you receive, freely you give. But we also see here very, very clearly that the oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. Virgins are lacking in oil. They're lacking in Yahweh's spirit, at least half of them. So the grain, the wine, and the oil for life and the kingdom. Psalm 104. Psalm 104. It says, Bless Yahweh, O my soul, O Yahweh, my Elohim, you are very great. You have put on honor and majesty. Verse 14, He causes the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for the service of man to bring food out of the earth. And wine cheers the heart of man. Oil makes his face shine. And bread sustains the heart of man. Showing the, 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 the full circle of life and the full circle of the agriculture. You know, like uh, I say, you can find out in a culture how important something is by how many words people have for something. Like in English, we have one word for camel. In the Arab world, they have something like 300 words. So what does that tell you? Camels are pretty important, you know, in the Arab world. The same in English, we have the word harvest. You know, we're going to harvest our wheat, we're going to harvest our corn, we're going to harvest our grain. But in Hebrew, there's a different word for harvest for every single thing you're harvesting. Different word for wheat, a different word for olives, different word for grapes, and also the grass. There's grass that's for wheat, there's grass for eating, there's grass for hay, there's all different words from it. So we see here, wine cheers the heart of man, oil makes his face shine, and bread sustains the heart of man. Oil makes your face shine. The Holy Spirit coming out from you makes your face shine, but the bread sustains the heart, you know? through uh, thistles, like it says in Genesis, that man will have to sustain himself through thistles and, and uh, whatnot. Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, because what we see is though if we're disobedient, if Israel wasn't listening, if they weren't following Yahweh's statutes and judgments and commandments, let's look what happens. Deuteronomy 28, verse 38. Deuteronomy 28, 38. He says, You shall carry much seed out to the field, and you shall gather in little, for the locusts will devour it. You shall plant vineyards and shall labor, and you shall not gather nor drink wine, for the worm will devour it. You shall have olive trees in your border, and you shall not anoint with oil, for your olive shall fall off. So basically, there's no blessing at all. No wine, no grain, no oil. Drop down to verse 51. And he shall eat the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your land, talking about your enemy, until you are destroyed. He shall not leave you grain, new wine, and oil, offspring of your oxen or young ones of your flock, until he has destroyed you. So again, it's showing the whole cyclical cycle of life, the cyclical cycle of agriculture, all comes with a blessing. The grain, the oil, the wine. And Yahweh is saying if we're disobedient, he's going to take that blessing away. Book of Joel, first chapter. Because the latter rain, we know, is primarily talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the early rain, the latter rain, but also talking about literal rain. You needed the early rain for crops, you needed the latter rain for fruition. So Yahweh uses that cycle to teach us about his harvest, the early harvest that was in the first century and the latter harvest that's coming. Joel 1 in verse 9. He's talking about verse 7. My vine is desolate and splintered. My fig tree, he's stripped and he's thrown it down. So we get to verse 9. He says, The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of Yahweh. The priests, the ministers of Yahweh, mourn. 
The field is wasted. The land mourns for the grain is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The olive tree droops. So again, somebody reading this from the West, they're just thinking, okay, they don't have anything. But when you come here and you understand the importance of each of these, you're really seeing it's a big picture. He's talking about what's coming here. He's talking about his blessing. He's talking about his spirit. He's talking about all these things. Be withered farmers, how vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree droops, the pomegranate and the palm tree and the apple tree. All the trees of the field are dried up, because joy has dried up from the sons of men. Right? There's no hadat. There's no hadat. It's all dried up. Gird up and lament, priests, how, ministers of the altar, come, spend the night in sackcloth, ministers of my Elohim, for the grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your Elohim. Yahweh's blessing is being held back there. But then when we go to chapter 2 and verse 19, what does he say? If we turn to him and rend our hearts and not our garments, and we plead to him and we repent, look what he says. Chapter 2 and verse 19, he says, Yeah, Yahweh will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and wine and oil. And you shall be satisfied with it. And I will no more make you a disgrace among the nations. Drop down to verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for Yahweh is doing great things. Fear not, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness grow green. For the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their spring. Then be glad, sons of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your Elohim. For he has given you the early rain according to righteousness, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the early rain and the latter rain, in the first month. And the floors will be full with grain, and the wine vat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years which the swarming locust has eaten, the locust larvae, the stripping locust, the cutting locust, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat fully and be satisfied. And you shall praise the name of Yahweh your Elohim, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall not be ashamed forever. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am Yahweh your Elohim, and there is no other. And my people shall not be ashamed forever. And it shall be afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also I will pour out my spirit on the slaves and on the slave girls in those days. So again we see that Yahweh's blessing is coming back to his people in the end days when there's repentance through what? The grain, the oil, and the wine. Hosea 14, two more scriptures and we'll be done. Hosea 14. The book of Hosea is a book completely about Ephraim. Ephraim's falling away and Ephraim's gathering back. Hosea 14 and verse 4. He says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be as the dew to Israel. He shall blossom as the lily and cast out his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall go out, and his beauty shall be like the olive tree, and his scent as Lebanon to him. They who live under the shadow shall return. They shall live like the grain and blossom like the vine. Their memorial will be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What is it to me anymore with idols? I answered it in an ice or bacon. I am as a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found from me. Who is wise and discerns these things? Who is discerning and knows them? For the ways of Yahweh are right, and the righteous will walk in them. But transgressors shall stumble in them. So again, showing that the people who are repenting, who are coming back to Yahweh, they're getting the blessing of the grain, the oil, and the wine. The scriptures in Jeremiah 31, when we look at the New Covenant, Jeremiah 31 in verse 10, just read verse 1 to start. At that time, again, Jewish Gideon says, Yahweh, I will be the Elohim of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. So all 12 tribes are back, right? And then we drop down to verse 10. Hear the word of Yahweh, O nations, and declare in the coastlands far away, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd his flock. 
For Yahweh has redeemed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand of the one stronger than him. And they will come and sing in the height of Zion and be radiant over the goodness of Yahweh for grain, for wine, and for oil, and for the sons of the flock and the herd. And their life shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not continue to languish anymore. Then the virgin will rejoice in the dance, both young men and the elders together. For I will turn their mourning to joy, and I will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. And I will fill the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says Yahweh. So, wow. This is, this is the completeness of the full covenant. And I say, not to diminish already that we are in the beginning of the new covenant, but we know we have a, an earnest, a down payment of the Holy Spirit. But until you're in the land, you're not in the fullness of the new covenant because at least two-thirds of the covenant promises are in the land. It's blessings from the land. So we are only in the very beginning. We're the embryo of the new covenant, but there's much, much more to come. So I really pray that maybe if you heard the sermon a month ago while you're listening uh, somewhere, wherever you're living, if, I'm sure it would have meaning to some of the people that would hear this. But I really hope after being here these last two weeks that it means more to you by actually going to the areas and seeing what areas are more blessed, right? Like you go to Shiloh where Yahweh's presence was for 390 years, and what do you find there? All of the vine, uh, grapevines that are over there, right? All the olive trees that's over there, and even the grain fields. That Yahweh's presence in these areas brought his blessing of life forevermore, right? The grain, the oil, and the wine. So, uh, it's been a, a blessing being with all of you. It's been a blessing having you here. And like they say, all good things must come to an end. So, uh, I know most of you will be leaving tonight and tomorrow. And maybe we'll just say a closing prayer for you and a blessing on you as you go out.